and welcome to this video on westward expansion in the United States from 1865 to 1890. By the end of the day we'll be able to describe the expansion westward, how they colonized the west and to what extent did they achieve manifest destiny, whatever that is. Manifest destiny, it starts in 1845 by the belief that God had chosen Americans to populate the lands from the Atlantic seaboard all the way across the Pacific Ocean. They had a divine right, God-given right to spread Christian and Republican values. And whoever was in their path, in this case it would be the Native Americans, would be civilised in quotation marks. If they didn't colonise it, then somebody else would. They'd already seen in the South, South America the impact of Europeans. It was a radical doctrine of white supremacy, that white, right, white was right. In the 1840s, there had been a huge influx into the West from groups such as Mormons. They were escaping persecution. They wanted to um, become independent and practice their own religion. The West offered the possibility of starting a new and better life with cheap and fertile land. The government actively encouraged it. In fact, 60,000 inhabitants and the territory could then apply to become a state. It starts with the 1862 Homestead Act and it gave the opportunity for anybody to buy 160 acres for just $10, but you had to improve it and cultivate it for five years as a minimum. However, there were some problems. 160 acres wasn't enough. Factory workers don't make good farmers. There was constant amounts of um, fraud. Most of them did live off the land, but it was a constant battle with the elements. There were swarms of locusts. Now the problem comes with, yeah, land is cheap, horses, livestock, wagons and others are very expensive. And the cheap availability of credit is fine, but there was high interest rates. And if you couldn't produce enough money and goods to sell, then you couldn't pay it back. And so the land was reclaimed. And there's countless accounts of this. By 1865, though, it was successful. 20,000 homesteaders had settled in the territories. And there was additional government acts, such as the Homestead with Timber and Culture and the Desert and Land Acts. And this essentially meant you, get, you got more land. But again, there were some requirements to what you did with it, such as planting trees. Who settled? Now, there was a number of African-Americans and immigrants. They uh, sought a better life out. White Americans who wanted to escape for the West Dream, the frontier, ex-Confederate sol soldiers. One third of cowboys, in fact, were Mexican, African-American, Asian or Native American. And when we talk about the gold rush, there is countless prospectors, as well as railway workers, and of course the Plains Indians. Gold is a major driving force in this. There's major gold strikes, there's major silver strikes. Uh, over time, the individuals just cannot compete with big businesses and what got, while gold is often the starting point very quickly big business takes over and that leads to the corruption that we see in the Gilded Age. Railroads are a driving force of westward expansion. 1862 Lincoln declares there's going to be the Pacific Railroad Act and it creates the Union Pacific Company and the Central Pacific Company and that they will meet at some point. Now by the 1890s there are four transcontinental lines. This means you can move from east to west easily. It brings the country together, it allows raw materials to move openly, it creates new markets and it means there is discounted travel available. The Native of Americans are the group that are most severely displaced in this period they were gradually removed from their lands that had traditionally belonged to them. Now we've got the Sand Creek Massacre in 1864 and the Great Sioux War. The Sand Creek Massacre is an American colonel leading his troops, Colonel Chivington, and he orders the slaughter of the Cheyenne and the Arapaho Indians. Eyewitness testimonies say that they were slaughtering men, women and children, and it was under the American flag even though the white surrender flag had been flying. What makes it even more despicable is that there was no charges brought forward against any of the men involved. In 1876, there's the Great Sioux War. So after the gold rush in South Dakota in 1848, it, uh, that leads to a huge influx of people into there. And this is where we get the famous battles such as the Battle of Bighorn, the Little Bighorn and Custer's Last Stand. The government tries to keep the prospectors away so that the Indians can keep their ceremonial land but there were too many of them so 
the government try an alternative method. They try offering them six million dollars. Again, they don't accept. What you've got to understand is that Native Americans aren't just one group of people. This is uh, a very diverse uh, groups. Each of them belong to different tribes and there's hundreds of tribes in this period. They don't speak a collective language and the majority of them don't have a written language either. So it's very difficult to communicate unless you speak the language and anything that you do agree upon isn't necessarily in writing either. Now the Great Sioux War is where we see the tribes uniting against the white Americans and they are very successful to begin with but by the end the might of America just takes over. American government decide on another approach, the reservations policy and we'll be talking about this in the next few topics certainly. It forces Native Americans to relocate to government controlled reservations and there's an agency involved. Now the agency agents themselves are very corrupt, they treat Native Americans particularly badly. It's an attempt to destroy their way of life and to separate them. Okay, It gets them uh, off their dependency on the buffalo, it tries to convert them to Christianity. Now. In this period we've got the westward expansion of white Americans that are already destroying the buffalo and the buffalo are the tribal way of life, they are the lifeline of Native Americans. Now the land is allocated to res reservations, proves almost impossible to cultivate. Thousands and thousands die as a result of starvation. It leads to a dependence on white American for food, clothing and shelter and it's humiliating for them. So why do the Native Americans by 1890 cease to be a problem? We've got thousands dead from war, thousands dead through famine, and the diseases that white Americans bring as well. So we've also got then the government attempts at reservation, bringing them together. And overall, it is very unpleasant treatment from white Americans towards the Native. Now by 1890, we've got the end of the cowboy. Ranching also becomes big business. Now cattle ranches, the lassos that you see in typical Hollywood films, they are the cowboys moving huge herds, thousands and thousands of um, cattle from one area to another so that they can be slaughtered, so they can be placed onto the trains and sent to the cities, the markets. There are new agricultural methods such as dry farming, new machinery, and in 1873 the invention of barbed wire. Believe it or not, that's one reason why the cowboys stopped in the West. Closed ranches took over, enclosed land. As a result, we've got huge increases of wheat exports, 6 million to 1867, 102 million by 1900, and there's no more need. There is no need for the cowboys that you see in typical films. So we've got the end of the frontier by 1890. Americans' dreams of manifest destiny had been fully achieved in their eyes. In the 1890 US Census said there can be hardly there there can hardly be said to be a frontier even. Now by 1890, we can't say that America is an unfinished nation anymore.